it, like I said, I've been doing this for 18 years, and when I got into banking, uh, one of the things, I didn't know anything about banking. I came from the restaurant industry. Um, I was married, I, and we weren't really very good with our money. I'll be quite honest, not very good with our money. And I went to my manager at the time um, at the bank, and I said, I need to know what is this banking stuff about? What do I do? And she just, I'll never forget her words, and they've really stuck with me over the time, and then they really have kind of um, been even more prominent in my life since I started teaching, and she, she just said, money's all about choices. We have a lot of choices. Um, sometimes life events might slap us in the face and we don't have a choice, you know, sometimes those choices are maybe more um, directed and we know exactly what we have to do, but for the most part, we have a choice. Do we buy that thing that's in the store that we really want that we may not need? Um, do we put money aside into a savings account? Do we invest? Do we contribute to our 401k? So on and so forth. Do we spend $100 at Target every time we go in? <laughs> I used to call it the $100 store ah. instead of the dollar store. Um, because I go in and then I have my own, my, my excuse so every time was, oh, it's on sale. And my husband's like, oh, it's on sale. <laughs> you know, like, even though I spent a hundred bucks. Um, so anyways, money is all about choices. And that really rang with me. It really kind of helped me figure out things um, when I came to my job. But not only that, it really helped my husband and I really start making some better decisions, some better choices. Um, and you're going to hear me say a lot that if we can give purpose to our money, we tend to have control of our money. If we just let it kind of come in and go out, and we don't know where it's coming in and going out, and we just kind of go every day, day by day, it tends to just kind of come in and go out. It doesn't actually go where we want it to go because we didn't give it a purpose. We didn't put it aside for X. We didn't set that, you know, that percentage over here for Y and it tends to just kind of come in and out and we don't really have much, it's not doing much for us. And even if we have a balance in there, it's not earning or growing on our behalf because we haven't given that money some purpose. So um, as we get, we're, we're gonna go ahead and let you open this up. So I've kind of wanted to do this, if you turn to page five, it talks about just the objectives that we're gonna talk about today. So really, just why is it important to save? So we're gonna be talking about budgeting and savings. Um, just determining some goals that you have identifying some options to save and then what can help you reach your goals and then briefly go over some investment investment options I am NOT a licensed banker so I will not be talking about investment options it talks a little bit about it inside here but I'll kind of give you guys some tools and resources to, to talk more about that that's actually a separate class where we bring somebody who's, a, who's licensed in who can talk more about the investment piece um, and then just how do, how do we how do we plan for maybe some of those big life events like um, going, you know, our kids for college, or if we're going to be buying a home, purchasing a car, and so on and so forth. Um, like I said, pages four through seven, if you're looking through that, there's just like some exercises that you can do. So if you're bored at night and you want to go ahead and pre-test yourself or post-test yourself, feel free to do that. Um, but I wanted to go to page nine. So if you turn to page nine in your booklet, it talks about um, what does it mean to pay yourself first. So Without really looking at the answers, what do you guys think it means? To, when, I, when, you, when you saw the class you could register for and it said pay yourself first, what was your first thought that this class would be about? Anybody? I promise I don't buy it. Setting up a savings account? Okay. Direct depositing so if you don't see it, you don't miss it. Kind of yep, thing. out of sight, out of mind. Love that concept. <laughs> Anything else? No? Cool. Um, I think that pay yourself first, a lot of times when people, when we're chatting with folks about managing their money, paying yourself first is actually the hardest thing to do for most people. Um, because they feel that they have all these obligations, you know, you have your, your rent or your mortgage, you have um, all these different bills that are coming through, if you have kids, you have obligations to pay for all these different things, these activities that your kids are in, maybe it's saving for their college education and so on and so forth, so sometimes, when you start look, when we, we talk to folks, one of the things that they're not doing, I've talked to a lot of people who aren't even contributing to their 401k yet. And that's actually a really great way to get started because if you think about that, you're paying yourself first, right? You're paying yourself, you're setting some of your money aside, your company is matching some of those funds, so they're giving you some of that money. It's earning interest and growing for you. So if anybody in the room is not contributing to your 401k, I highly recommend looking into the program. Talk to Jennifer if you're not sure where to go. Um, but definitely when it comes to paying yourself first, that's going to be the number one way when, you, when you're um, working that you can actually, like you said, out of sight, out of mind. If you start um, 
doing that, you will adjust. It's amazing how the human will adjust to the amount that's coming in um, without even thinking about, oh, $50 went out this way. It, you adjust to your actual paycheck. So that's actually something that we very highly recommend doing. Um, it also, it also what, what's hard is people are like, well, I can't really pay myself first because I don't want to be late on my X bill or whatever this bill is, Sears or whoever you're paying. Um, and a lot of times it just takes, it takes some time to kind of figure out what exactly is going out, what exactly is coming in, and usually there's something inside of that going out that's a want. It's not necessarily a need. And so if we can figure out, okay, let's trim some of that want down, there's always some room to put some money aside. I had one gal one time at one of my classes said, well, Kim, what if I don't even have a dollar to put aside? And I said, um, name five things that you bought in the last 24 hours. And she listed a Mountain Dew from the vending machine. Um, she listed a, a granola bar that she had bought like at the little cafe area and a couple other things. And I said, were those wants or were those needs? And she's like, okay. <laughs> so she realized what I, was, what I was getting at. Like there is a dollar. Like I know that everybody has a dollar at least to put away if you take into consideration some of your stuff you have to pay, right? You have to pay your bills. You don't want to be late on your bills. Those are your obligations, but there's always some wiggle room within that want, sub, that want category that we can take and start paying ourselves first. And a lot of times when people start doing that and they start putting aside some money, even if it's $5 a paycheck, I don't care what the amount is, it kind of gives you that peace of mind of, okay, I have $50 over there, or I have $500 over there, or I have $5,000 over there. It gives you that peace of mind, and eventually you'll get enough in there that you're going to feel really comfortable, and you don't, you don't, it's not going to be like if you have to get new tires on your car, you don't have that, that gut-wrenching uh, scary, scariness inside of you going, oh my gosh, how am I going to pay for this? You feel like, okay, I could tap into that, that's what that was for, I can now pay for whatever it is that came up that was an emergency situation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, the, some of the other things, um, what are some things that you guys think that we would, a person would want to save for? Just list some things that you guys would want to save for in life. House? Or vacation? If you have a house, there's always something that needs fixing or repairing yes. or save for a boiler or something. Yeah, like a household fund, awesome. right? <laughs> Anything else? Car. Car? Mm -hmm. College education would be another one. I think that oh, I know I have a nine and a ten year old, so that's important to us. Is we got to start figuring out. And when you start looking at how much college costs mm -hmm. today, and then calculating ten years from now, it's like, oh, how are we going to pay for this? They're probably going to be on their own. No more granola bars for you, girl. Exactly right. <laughs> Um, so that's something, you know, the, the thing is, it, normally people have a reason why they want to save, right? Like you're putting some money for some specific reason, and if you don't have a reason, it's always nice to be able to have a spot to put it versus just leaving it in your checking account. I do have lots of clients, they'll have conversations where they'll have a majority of their money sitting in their, in their checking account, and they may not even have a savings account or they have a small amount, and it's the mentality of, well, just in case if anything ever happens, I want to make sure I have access to tap into it when really they could actually start taking some of that money and earning. Because if you get to the point where you aren't technically saving for a specific thing, then that's actually a really comfortable state to be in because now you can start investing, you can start having that money work a little bit for you. You worked really hard to put the money in there, now have it work a little bit more for you. So there's definitely different vehicles that you can use to try to help that. And it doesn't really matter the amount. Um, there's lots of different savings account products and money markets, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but there's lots of ways that you can um, help maximize the money that you've already earned. Make sense so far? Okay. Um, if we go to, so see how we whiz through, we're already like through page nine, right? <laughs> if we turn to page 10, it's gonna start talking about a few things. So I'm gonna narrow uh, basically this packet down to about 14 things. Some of these you're gonna be like, yep, I do that, great. Some of these you're gonna say, nope, no way well, I will ever do that. And some of these will be like, aha, like that's actually a really good idea, I should try that, right? So I apologize ahead of time if something in here is something you already do, but I wanna make sure that everybody in the class is aware of some really good savings tips of things to kind of, and it's all really actually about choices and your kind of your mental um, thinking about money that can help actually change the way you're doing things in order to help you build that savings account up. 
The first one is the needs versus wants. So we talked about that a little bit already. Um, and just really kind of figuring out where is my money going? Um, there's a lot of different apps, if you will. There's an app for that. Isn't that like a saying? There's an app for that. There's lots of different tools that you can use out there that will actually help you figure this out or calculate it out. But if, if nothing else, you don't want to use an app or you, want, you have a pen and a piece of paper, you literally can write down everything that you're spending and really figure out needs versus wants very quickly. It is an exercise that I highly recommend everybody do, no matter how much money you have in your savings or how little you have in your savings. Because a lot of times it's kind of one of those gut, gut checks of, okay, wow, we're spending a lot of money on this. Um, and by putting it on paper, it's kind of one of those things where it's not just coming in and going out, like I was talking about earlier. Now you're really seeing, okay, we spent, you know, 40% of our money on restaurants. That was ours when we did ours. I don't know if 40% was the right number, but we spent a lot eating out. And we, we, have, we have kids, we both work full time, so that was kind of one of ours, like, oh, let's just grab something, right? But when we actually wrote down the dollar amount of how much we were spending out, because you don't think, okay, Taco Bell, 20 bucks, whatever it is, you don't think 20 bucks is a big deal, but then you start taking that times four times each week and then whatever, it's a lot of money. So that, I always encourage everybody to write it down. So you can either, sometimes, I know like with BMO on our, we have an online platform, we have what's called Total Look. And that'll actually divide everything out. It'll actually show you here's how much money you're spending in each different category. There's also a thing called mint.com that's a, a website that you can go to that will pull in like all of your different um, places that you have your accounts and it'll actually help you calculate it. Um, so there's lots of things that you can do um, that can help you figure that out. Most people have a hard time getting over this first step and that's just because it's time consuming, right? And it's kind of like one of those things where, at least for me, I always compare money to like weight loss. Like, you have to have an accountability partner, and when, you, when I step on the scale, it's like that gut thing of, ugh, I need to do something, right? Normally, this exercise is kind of like looking in the face, okay, I gotta do something, I gotta make a change. And again, it could be where I don't have very much in my savings, all the way to I have a lot of savings. How do I use my money, and am I being smart about it? If I'm not being smart about it, is there something I can change that can actually help then make my savings account a little bit better? Because everybody obviously wants to get to that point where we can retire and not have that stress and be able to travel more, see the country, do some things that we've always wanted to do. And if we don't set ourselves up for that, it's not gonna be the picture that we're thinking at the end if we aren't preparing ourselves now. So it doesn't matter how old you are. I know I had one, um, one of my students was like, well, I'm, he was like 22, he's like, I'm not gonna worry about that right now, I got all this time. And I'm like, really, this is actually the time you should be thinking about it. Because if you actually got really good at it now, Imagine where you're going to be, you know, 20, 30 years from now, you've already set yourself up. So waiting can actually hurt us too if we wait too long. Um, the other thing that, um, thinking about when you're talking about needs versus wants, think about not just about like eating out or spending $100 at Target, but what about the services that you're paying for? Are you paying for cable and you're not really using it? Um, is there a cable provider that maybe might be cheaper? They do say like an average person should check that out every couple of years just to see is there another cable company out there that might give us a better deal for a certain amount of time. Um, insurance, like your car insurance, homeowner's insurance, rentals insurance, they say you should check that every year just to see am I getting the best rate that I can possibly get? Is there any way I could save a few dollars here or there by switching? Um, and then memberships, uh, that was a gut check from my husband and I. We were paying for a membership and we're going like three times, a, uh, three times a month. So it didn't make much sense. We actually scratched it and then put the money aside until we had enough money to buy a treadmill. And now we have a treadmill that we use once or twice a month. Um, <laughs> but at least, at least I'm not paying like $50, $60 a month for something that I'm not using. So don't just think about, like I said, like eating out and kind of like the the given things, think about some of the other stuff. Because cable is a want, it's not a need, right? We don't need cable to survive. We have Netflix and all these other things now that we could we could take advantage of a you, uh, what is it called? Hulu, Hulu, my husband was talking about that one the other day. So check around, see if you're getting the best price. Sometimes you'll find that you are in the right, right spot, but it doesn't hurt to check just to make sure that you're doing the right things. The second thing would be making sure that you're using direct deposit. And you may say, why are you asking me to do direct deposit? Um, one of the things that we were talking about earlier was out of sight, out of mind. When you do a direct deposit, you can also do auto pays or you can do a portion. I'm not sure if you guys can do a portion into savings. Okay. I highly recommend putting your check into your checking account, but take a portion and pay yourself first, just like you did with your 401k. 
it's an out of sight, out of mind thing. You still have access to those funds if you have an emergency. It's not like you can't get to it if you need to get to it. But definitely consider it because you will find that you will adjust. You will adjust to that paycheck amount and over time you'll actually then start having a little lump sum into your savings account. So if you have the capability, which you do here at NG, to do direct deposit, I highly recommend it because again, it can help you kind of separate and do that out of sight, out of mind. <clears throat> The third thing is make sure that you pay your bills on time. And you might say, okay, Kim, you're talking about savings. We're not talking about credit right now. Paying your bills on time is key for everything. Um, there's a whole like three other classes that I could talk about when it comes to credit. But if you're ever late on some of your bills, that can ding your credit. It can charge late fees. Um, it can charge higher interest and things like that. So when you're figuring out your needs and your wants and you're figuring out, okay, here's how much is coming in and how, here's how much is going out, you have to take into consideration these are my obligations, whether good, bad, or ugly, of these are my, my bills that I pay out. How am I gonna have to make, I have to make sure I'm paying these on time and I have to make sure I'm paying the minimum on these at all times because it can really hurt you, not only on the credit side, but it can also hurt you on the savings side because now you're paying more in interest, you're paying more in late fees, and it can kind of snowball into an effect where then you really are feeling even worse than before. So paying your bills um, on time is definitely, you have to do that. The one thing I will say is when you look at your whole, when we talk about your budget and you're talking about here's my bills, there are there is some wiggle room in changing like your due dates sometimes with companies. So if you feel that when you looked at them, you're like, you wrote them all down, and a majority of all your bills are due like on the 15th, there may be some wiggle room to be able to say, can I pay, you know, call them up and pay a couple bills over here at the beginning of the month and maybe one or two at the end of the month so we're not all like consuming at the middle of the month. So that's a way that you can try to help if, if you feel like you're you're strapped in some, in um, maybe during the parts of the month you're like, oh, that was a big hit. Now I have hardly any money to do anything with. That might be something to think about is when your payments are due, how to change those so that that can help you out. When it comes to um, paying those off, you, I'm sure you guys have all seen a million different ways, a million different things of how to pay your debt off, right? There's so many different pieces of opinion and advice and all that kind of stuff out there of what to do and what to pay off first and how to pay your debt off, the snowball effect, things like that. I am not here to endorse any of them. I'm here to endorse do something. So if you have debt and you want to pay it off, you have to start somewhere. If you don't start and you let your money come in and you let your money go out, that's where you're going to be in six months from now. So my advice is just to find something that you feel works for you. It's like um, anything else in life, not, you know, something that works for me may not work for you and vice versa. We all kind of have to find something that we feel comfortable with and that we believe in and that's going to help us mentally keep going and keep trying to do that. Um, so that we can pay our stuff off, right? Because that's the ultimate goal is to be able to try to get as much of our debt paid off as possible so that we have that freedom and that we have even more money that we can put into that savings so that we can do more things that we want to do for fun. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, considering opening a checking account at a bank instead of using check cashing stores. That This one, I mean, in today's world, I think the last time I had talked to a customer, it was like 25 to $30 to cash a check. So. Mm -hmm. If you're in a position where you're having to pay to cash a check, I highly recommend shop around for banks, see if there's a bank that you can um, get into, because if you're paying $25 every paycheck to, to cash your check, that's just money going out the door that you could be saving or that you could be using towards a bill. It, and it's, I feel like it's getting more and more expensive as I've been in banking. I remember it used to be like 10 bucks, I think, when I first started. And I, I swear that's what he said, 25 to $30 is how much he was paying. So if you're using that, don't do it. Um, just because there are banks out there that you'll, you should be able to get a, a bank account. And if you have any questions on that, feel free to talk to me after or talk to Martha and we can help give you some solutions or some suggestions because it definitely can help you save some money. Um, Putting your savings account, uh, this one is kind of interesting if you um, think about it. We were talking about um, out of sight, out of mind. So whenever you have, let's say you get a raise or a bonus, uh, maybe you got a tax refund or anything like that, so any extra cash that wasn't happening before, considering giving that purpose. I talked about that earlier. If you just let your raise 
go into your paycheck or you let your tax refund just go into your checking account, it tends to just go in there and then it just goes out and then you can look back and go, oh my goodness, what happened to that extra X amount of dollars that I'm earning every month or what happened to my, my tax refund or whatever it was. Um, so really making sure that you pre-plan changes that are happening in your life. So if you know you're gonna be getting a raise, typically you know about the raise before it actually starts and you see it in your paycheck. Really calculate that out, figure out what that amount is, and maybe that's the portion that you put into the savings account versus your checking account. Because then now your check, your actual ch paycheck is the same exact price, or price, same exact amount, and then your savings account now is actually accumulating every, every two weeks. Do you get paid every two weeks or every, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's accumulating some money so that you have a savings account. So consider that. One of the things that it talks about in there is um, putting your birthday money in your savings account. I have a really hard time with that one because that's like <laughs> my birthday and I want to be able to spend it on me. But some people I've, I've talked to, they, have, they do do that. So if they get any cash for their birthdays, if they don't really need anything or weren't really wanting anything, they throw it into the savings account. Just don't leave it in your checking or it will, it'll end up going out the door typically. Um, the other thing that we did this, my husband and I did this, and this really kind of helped launch us start to pay off some of our debt. And that was when you pay off a loan, consider the amount that you're paying to either put into your savings account. I know there's some advice out there of maybe pay it, put that money towards the next bill, which is fine. But if you don't have an emergency fund set up over here, you still are gonna be like hurting if you have to get new tires on your car or that emergency situation comes up and you're like, ugh, now I don't have enough to pay for it. Yes, you're paying off your debt, but if I would highly recommend, again, my own personal opinion, putting some money and get your emergency fund set up first. And I, I know uh, the talk about emergency fund, if you Google the emergency fund amount, there's a ton of different things out there. Some people say three to six months. Some people say six to 12 months. Some people say 12 to 18 months should be that emergency fund. Again, I feel like that's your personal preference. Whatever you feel is an amount that you would feel comfortable if an emergency situation happens, or let's say you get laid off, or something happens with your income for a shorter period of time, or you weren't expecting it, what is that amount that you would feel comfortable with? Some people say like take your expenses times three. Some people, you know, so there's all these different formulas that you can do. But again, the whole purpose of saving and paying yourself first is to make sure you have that emergency fund for something, if anything ever happens, you feel a little bit better. And then once you have that emergency fund, then it's starting to make that money work for you a little bit more. I mean, like we said, we talked earlier about investing and having that money work a little bit harder for you. Um, <clears throat> The other thing, um, the last, they, they say the, um, the cash, so like if you receive, we already, I guess we talked about this, part of your cash gift you receive, put it into a savings account. So that's up to you guys. I do not do that. I don't like to do that. <laughs> I want to keep my, my birthday money. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that they talk about is uh, making sure that we're not putting luxury like wants on our credit. Meaning, going on vacation with your credit card when you don't actually have the money to pay for the vacation. I get using the credit card for your vacation because you can earn points and all that fun stuff, but when you get back from vacation, if you don't have the money to pay for vacation, not such a smart move, because now you're gonna be paying interest on your vacation, so your vacation just went up by whatever interest that you are paying on your current credit card. So it's really important, if you have some things that you wanna do, again, set aside some money for those specific things. I have one client that actually has 15 different accounts and he has a purpose for every single one. I'm not saying that I want you guys to go out and open 15 accounts, that's just how he manages it, because he wants to visually see I've got this much in there for vacation, I've got this much in there for whatever. Some people have spreadsheets, they may have one main savings account, but in the spreadsheet they know, okay, 500 is for the household stuff, you know, 1,000 is for emergency, and whatever. So whatever is your preference, but definitely you kind of need to know Again, what are you saving for and what is this money for? So that, because if you don't, again, even if you have, let's say, 5000 or or $1,000 sitting in a savings account, if you don't have a purpose for it and you need something over here, it's a want, you're like, oh, I got a thousand bucks, I'm just gonna go ahead and buy whatever this is, right? Because this $1,000 didn't really have a meaning. It was, it's sitting there, it's ours, we can spend it. But if we give it a meaning, we tend to not buy the want because that meaning over here means I'm saving that for that specific reason. Does that make sense? 
it's literally mental, right? There's nothing about it that's, that's scientific. There's no magic formula. It literally is how do I mentally keep myself from buying that nice pair of shoes or whatever it is. Although I'm not a shoe shopper, so I don't know why I said that. <laughs> um, and then the other thing, paying off like high interest credit cards, loans as soon as you can. Again, that comes to your opinion of it. There's a lot of advice out there. Pay your highest interest credit cards off first versus your lowest. Pay your lowest amount owed versus your highest. I really don't care as long as you have a plan and that that's what your if that's your end goal is to try to pay off some of your debt to increase your income, then get on a plan. I don't care what that plan is, just make sure you're on it. Does that make sense? Um, this one, say, this is a fun one I actually do with my kids. Save your loose change at the end of the day and deposit it weekly, monthly into your savings account. Um, I do that with my kids. If you go to the bank uh, and they take the, the change, or you can go to like the little change counters. I know like Walmart and different places have a little change thing. They guess to see how much is in there, and then we put that into their savings. Really great activity to help teach kids how to do it. The other thing, I have customers that will save like a big, huge jug, and then that's kind of what they use for a, a particular thing. Maybe it's they're spending money for vacation or whatever. They kind of tag that money that's in that jar for a specific reason. I know that sounds like a silly one, but almost everybody has a change jar at home, whether it's on your dryer, right? If we do that, I can honestly yeah. validate that one. It's, I'm not gonna call big, but it yeah. is amazing. Like, every time we cash it, bring it to the dollar. Yep. That's not on the average. It is yep. shocking. It is shocking, and so it's usually much more. jars for our kids to do this. Yep. Because it, it's for those little extra things yep. that now we're taking and putting it into college yep. savings funds for our grandkids, but That's awesome. it is amazing how quickly yep. that can happen. It grows. And then you do have to be committed to like saying every week, I'm going to open my purse, what are change I yeah. mm -hmm. you got to throw it in. Yeah. Like, so you do have to make the commitment to do it. Like every yep. night my husband empties his pocket and it just goes yep. right in the change. We actually have like a little container so. by the washer because you know if you're yeah. emptying out the pockets before laundry and then my husband's got one by the dresser because he unloads his pockets yeah. by the dresser and then you're right we have to make we just go around and dump it into yeah. the big the big bucket it but really it does add up it does add up and the kids love it if you kind of if you have kids they start getting into it they'll actually start stealing your change to put in there because they're trying to figure you know they're trying to fill that up a little faster but if you give them an end goal you know like i always with my savings account with my kids some of it they get to keep like they don't have to put it all into their savings accounts so then they're like ooh, i can buy my whatever um so they're immediately thinking okay i'm i can get something out of this if i do it so definitely a fun exercise to do and one that it's probably not on the top 10 ways to save, right? Like if you Googled that and from the analysts and the investment people, that's probably not one of the suggestions, but it's a really just good way to kind of help make sure that you're thinking about the money and that you're giving it purpose and you can get your whole family involved in the activity. Um, and we already talked about the tax refund, so I won't go into more detail there. Um, just the recommendation is to make sure that you're either putting if it's gonna go into a direct deposit, ask if they can split it between checking and savings. Or once it goes into your checking, know the amount that you are gonna to wanna to save of that. And once you see it hit as your direct deposit, throw it over into a savings account. And just out of sight, out of mind, get it over into a savings account working for you. Um, we talked about the 401k, and I'm probably not following along if you guys are looking. I'm not sure where we're at here. Um, I think I'm still there. Um, 401k, so if you're not doing that, I really encourage you to, to start looking at your 401k, contribute to your 401k. Can you do a Roth? Do you know in your 401k? Um, I don't Inside it? Have you heard of that? Okay. Okay. So that's something to look at too. A lot of companies are starting to have just a regular 401k, but then they also have a Roth option. So you can actually put after tax dollars into a Roth of inside of your 401k. So a different way of kind of looking at your money. One is pre tax, one's after tax. Um, something to think about, look at it. I don't know if your plan will have it, but that is something new that a lot of companies are starting to offer. It's just a great way to help increase your, your savings and then at the end being able to have less taxes coming out because you've paid taxes on some of it. The last one on there is doing your homework when it comes, comes to investing. Um, a BMO, one of the things that we really um, talk to our clients about is just making sure that the customer is well educated and making a really sound decision. Um, when you start investing and you start putting some of that money away, maybe you've gotten your checking account under control, your budget's under control, 
Now you have your emergency fund set where you feel it's pretty good. Now that's when you can start kind of moving some of this money and making it work for you. And there's no surefire thing that I could say today. I'd probably have a line out the door if I had a way that I could make you a million dollars by the end of the year, right? Yeah. Like that, that is just, there's no surefire way to do it. So I really encourage everybody to sit down with a banker and talk to them no matter what the amount is. Find out what solutions there are out there. There's so many different things that you can do. There's CDs, there's money markets, there's investments, annuities, all those kind of different things. Um, but talk to somebody. You know, that's what the banks are for. That's what we do. That's what we're talking about. All those different products and services on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you don't have somebody that you're talking to about it, and I encourage doing it outside of just your friends and family. I know a lot of people get advice from their friends and family, and that's fine. If you've had a referral, you know, like somebody who's had a really great experience and they've done this and that or whatever, or they work with somebody, that's fine. I just encourage you to find somebody that's not just your friends and family, though. Even maybe getting a second opinion on some of your stuff. If you feel like, man, I've been with the same, these same people for a long time. I haven't talked to them. I had one client there like, yeah, I've been with this company for like 20 years, but I haven't talked to a rep in like probably 10 that's a good sign of maybe we should have a second opinion because who knows what's going on with your with your accounts. We should really make sure everything is going the way you want it to go. Um, there's lots of situations where I've encountered, and I'm sure Martha has even more stories, of just like clients coming in. I had one lady in particular that her husband passed away and he handled all of the money. So he took care of all the money. He had all their investments. Um, she had obviously access to the checking account and did spending and things like that, but for the most part, he was handling it. Well, he, when he passed away, she just assumed it was all fine, right? Like he had it taken care of, she just assumed it was all okay. And, and we had recommended just doing a sit down of a second opinion on looking at her accounts, everything that she had, where everything was at, just to see if we were missing anything. And here he had some of his investments on a very aggressive, like very risky um, investment options, and which were fine for him because he was looking at it every day, knew what it was, knew what to watch for. So he was doing stuff um, almost on a daily basis, but then when he passed away, obviously nobody's managing that, it was actually costing her a lot of money and she was losing a lot of money on the, on the back end. Um, and I, I say that story not to say that that's where everybody is at, but I say that story because I don't care where you're at in your finances, who manages your finances, whether that's you or your spouse or partner, make sure that you're in it together and that you understand it together. And I make my husband, like he, I manage the money, but I make him sit down and I actually make him log into online banking because I used to not do that and he never knew how to, like I was out of town and he couldn't get into online. I'm like, come on, you know the online banking password, right? So, but I make him do that so that he is aware, okay, this is what we got going on, this is where things are happening, this is the user ID and password. And you, would, you don't think about that when you're in the midst of it, you don't, not, you're, you're just doing it, like you're logging in and doing your thing. Um, but when something happens, when an emergency happens, that's when you're like, oh my goodness, where's the password? What, how do I get in this? And another thing to think about too is like your parents. Um, I know my parents are getting up there and I'm constantly, my, my dad, he just changed his password the other day. I'm on his account and I'm like, what did you change your password for? Because I'm looking, I wanna make sure that he's not getting subject to any elder abuse or anything like that. But then also like, why'd you change your password? What's going on? Like, is everything okay? And then that makes sure that I know, because my mom had a stroke uh, 10 years ago, and that was actually something that was really eye-opening to me as their daughter. Uh, mom did all of the finances, everything. And when she went into the hospital, dad didn't know the passwords, he didn't know what kinds of accounts they had, and so not only is he dealing with his wife in the hospital with a stroke, he's also thinking, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to get in. So literally while she was at the hospital, we went to their bank and added me to the account so that I could help. He didn't know how to order checks. He didn't even know how to write a check, honestly. Um, and now until this day, they, she's um, paralyzed and he does the finances. But man, when we first did that 10 years ago, that was really hard on him. Like you could just tell the stress of not only his spouse hurt, but now he's like, how come I wasn't, how come I didn't pay attention to this a little bit more? So don't let yourself get into that situation. And even if you're not married, make sure like maybe your, your parents or somebody else that you know is involved in that. Um, just so that if something ever happens to you. And I had another situation where I had a client who had quite a bit of money and he didn't have beneficiaries listed on his accounts. And I kept saying, you need to get beneficiaries on your accounts and you know maybe even set up an estate or trust or things like that. And he's like, well, when I'm dead, that money is not mine anymore anyway. And I'm like, 
yes, I get that. However, if when you pass away, if you don't title things the right way or put them in the right types of accounts, pretty much your money is not gonna go where you want it to go. Even if you wanted the money to go to, let's say, a nonprofit or something that you're very passionate about, it's not going there. If you don't direct it there, it won't go there. And don't think that you have to be a millionaire to have money if something happens to you and you pass away. My sister passed away of cancer a few uh, about seven years ago, and I kept telling her, you need to make sure you have stuff set up. She's like, nope, I'm, not, I'm fine, I don't have any money. I'm like, everybody has some sort of money, and even if it's not money, you may have some valuables or some things that are dear, near and dear to your heart. In our situation, it actually created some division between our kids because there was a little bit of insurance money, there was a little bit of uh, money that came from her. She had a small insurance plan and then she had some insurance with her company. Not huge, but do you think you, my niece and nephew got any of that money? No, not a dime. All of it went to the attorneys. So if she would have just put beneficiaries that I want my kids to have this, they would have gotten the money and they probably would still be talking today. And it's amazing what money can do. And again, I say those two dramatic differences because even if you think you don't have money, if you pass away, there are things that can divide people on this side. Um, and like one thing with my sister, I love to cook, and she taught me how to cook. And just things like her recipes, like we had a hard time getting her recipes um, and her cookbooks and stuff like that. So if you don't have a will, I highly encourage doing a will. It helps protect your assets and it helps direct where you want things to go. It's not very expensive to do a will. Um, and if you don't have a POA and a POD on your accounts, I highly encourage doing that. Beneficiaries are very easy to add on any, any of your accounts. You can usually, like on your 401k, you can list beneficiaries. On your um, life insurance, you can list beneficiaries. On any of your checking savings, just ask your bank. They can add beneficiaries. Um, adding a POA or like a health directives, those cost a little bit of money, maybe putting it in with your will. Um, my husband and I paid about $400 for ours, so it wasn't hugely um, expensive. We were able to pay it actually over time. They worked out a payment plan for us when we did it a while back. Um, and I, I know that doesn't have necessarily anything to do with paying yourself first, but it actually does because when you start doing this, you're going to have some money, and I want you to make sure you're protecting it. So making sure that the money that you have um, is going to be protected for those that you want to have it if something ever happens to you. So I highly recommend wills, POAs, POAs. Um, and do a, do a gut check on those every once in a while. I usually tell people, treat your banker like you do your doctor and see them once a year. You go in for a physical typically once a year. You should be talking to your financial advisor, talking to your banker at least once a year. We are always having things change. You know, can you get, relate? Like your bank has probably changed a lot in the last even six to 12 months. There's either another account coming out, there's a new special, there might be a different interest rate on this product, there might be a fee on this product that didn't have a fee before. So highly recommend doing a quick uh, review with your accounts with your banker to ensure that you're in the right types of accounts, that you're not getting fees anywhere, so that you're not paying fees up the other side somehow, um, and just making sure your accounts are titled correctly. Um, we had that, I've had that happen a lot where people thought they had the beneficiaries listed and then when we showed them, they're like, oh my gosh, I don't even talk to that person anymore. <laughs> and they're like, okay, well we probably should change your beneficiary if that's not who you want to have get your money because that's who's gonna get it. So just things like that. Just kind of think of that when you're spring cleaning and, and doing some of those other things. Think of your finances at that same time once a year of kind of making sure that all of your stuff's in check. Does any, does any of that make sense? Does that be helpful? I know, again, some of that you probably are like, yep, I do that, or yep, that's a good idea. Um, so I don't, hopefully it wasn't too basic, but I think these are some of the things that if you were to Google, you know, what are my best savings options, these are probably not in there, partially because these are just more practical, everyday things that we can kind of think about that can help lead us then to some of those other investments. Um, if you look on page 12, I'm not going to go in detail of this, but I want to make sure I point it out. If you look at like page 12 through 14, it does talk about like annual compounding and daily compounding. It also talks about like how interest is going to compound, like how your money is compounding over time. And then it, on page 13, it kind of gives you kind of some, um, some accounts that have no interest versus some interest. Interest is starting to tick back up. We've seen prime go up. Um, Again, this lately, and so deposit rates are starting to tick back up. We've seen obviously some better CD uh, rates that are coming out, um, some money market specials that we have that's starting to kind of come back up. 
So I know if we, my classes that I've been teaching the last couple of years with rates being low, savings and CDs and those were always pretty low. But at least I always tell my clients zero, you know, 1% or 0.5% is better than 0%. So if there's a way that you can earn some interest, definitely take advantage of it. And if you have any questions on that, like you can read through this, got the example, um, obviously you can see last two if you have any questions. We got the rule of 72 if you wanna figure out like how um, the interest rate and what would I earn over time and how would that calculate out. Um, and also on page 14, if you look at page 14 and 15, I think it goes into, um, it talks about like the difference between like savings accounts, like obviously a savings account and a money market, those are FDIC insured if you're going to a FDIC, it's FDIC insured bank. Um, savings typically have an interest rate that, uh, and so do money markets. If you're in one that doesn't, that's not a money market. Um, and then there's also like some non-deposit investment products. Um, if you look at like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, things like that, those are not FDIC insured and different types of products that you can look into. And all of them have different um, requirements. So again, talk to a banker, and if the banker that's in front of you is not licensed, they would get somebody who is licensed that can talk to you about those other products. They all have different uh, you know, minimum requirements and things like that. Um, the FDIC ones are gonna be obviously a little bit lower probably in a percentage rate than a stock bond mutual fund because you're taking a little bit of a risk that they're not FDIC insured. But on the flip side of not being FDIC insured, some of those products are also insured in a different way. So again, talk to your financial advisor, talk to your banker about all the different options that you can, you can um, take advantage of. Um, so if you look through, like if we skim through like 17, 18, it literally is talking about stocks, bonds, it tells you exactly what those are, what, they, what they're all about, um, and then if you have some questions about it. Um, and it also talks about IRAs if you keep going. Um, talks a little bit about your 401k, which we won't go into because you guys obviously have your 401k. If you don't understand your 401k, um, there's usually always a rep or a phone number that you can call in regards to your 401k and have them explain it to you. Um, or if you have a bank that you bank with, typically a, a licensed um, investment a financial advisor at your bank can talk to you about your 401k as long as you bring it in and they can see where it's allocated. They can actually help you make some decisions if you want to try to tweak it and make sure your allocations are going where you want them. Uh, that's something that a lot of people don't do. They'll just typically go with whatever the 401k is going into and they just kind of let it go. But I do advise looking at it or have somebody look at it to make sure you're going in the right types of things because everybody's got a different risk tolerance. So there might be something that you could use to help make a little bit more money on your 401k. Um, and again, look how fast we're whizzing through this. Um, <laughs> I am not gonna go, so the rest of this, the 529 plans are great for kids. Um, if you wanna start saving for their college, rather than just putting it into just a simple savings account, 529 plans are awesome. Talk to your advisor about those if you have questions. Um, and then there's a little activity on the back that just kind of goes through kind of a knowledge check of what we learned today. Um, and then if you go to the very back on page 32, I think it starts, there's actually a glossary. So if I said the term like um, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and you're like, I have no idea what those are, there's actually a glossary there that tells you what they are, maybe a little bit more of a definition of those. Um, and then on the last page, um, if you have any questions on like FDIC insurance, like if I said that term and you're like, I don't know what she's talking about, this is what it is. There's a website, there's actually a 24 hour line, but you can learn a lot about um, FDIC. You can actually plug in your own dollars, which is kind of cool. So if you know the dollar amount that you have, you can actually see how much of that is covered by FDIC insurance. Um, and then there's also the, um, there's, other, there's some other resources there too that kind of back up basically some of the content we talked about today. Any questions from anybody? At what point, as we start to just build our regular checking account or savings economy, mm -hmm. at what point do you feel like, because that's pretty low interest usually, yep. when do you make that step, like, the when you to make interest work best for you? I think it's once you have that emergency fund mm -hmm. number, so if you, whatever that number is, once you feel like you have that, mm -hmm. that's when I feel it's a good time to start thinking about doing something else. And maybe... Maybe it's something you're gonna invest in a particular thing that needs, let's say, $2,000. I'm just making this up, but let's just say whatever you're investing in, 
is going to take $2,000 for it to make sense to do it. Maybe you stick it in that emergency fund for now, but know, okay, as soon as I get my extra $2,000, I'm going to tag it to go over here. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. And then once you get that, obviously when you have the $2,000, now you're investing in this, then maybe it's something else that you go through. And I highly recommend a financial advisor looking at, um, we do that for free for our clients of, of just doing a financial plan. I don't know, has anybody ever had them sit down and do a plan where they show you how much money you'll have when you go to retire? Shows you like your forecast. It's pretty enlightening. Um, I don't care what age you're in. If, even if you're just starting, it kind of tells you at the pace you're going today and the things that you're doing today, this is what you'll have at the end and this is the age that you wanted to retire at. It shows you how much you have. Um, if any of you are interested in doing that at BMO, let me know or Martha, we can have somebody run the numbers for you. Um, your financial, if you have a financial advisor, they should be able to, to do that. I wouldn't pay for one. I know there are some places that require like 500 bucks to do that plan. I don't think it would be worth $500 to show you that plan, I guess, unless it's your financial advisor and it's part of something that they're doing. I don't know. I would caution paying for it, I guess, is my advice there. Good question. Any other questions? I'll send the link for sure for the Your Financial University. Um, like I said, you know, the, when I talked about it earlier, money is all about choices. It's all about putting something into place um, and making a, a change. In order for us, no matter what situation we're in, no matter how much money we have, in order for us to get from A to B, we have to take a step, right? Um, and we would love to help you if there's something that BMO can help you with. You, did, you do have some other materials in your um, packet. One is just a quick flyer. You guys are eligible for some special uh, discounts and some cash incentives for opening a checking account with BMO as part of our program here with Minji. Um, maybe you're thinking, you know what, I need to start an emergency fund, but I don't know what to do. It, sometimes even I have some clients that have to have an out of sight, out of mind bank. So have you ever heard of that? I mean, they have like two or three different two or two, two or three different banks because each bank has a purpose. And if mentally that's what you need, that's what you need. Like I have some people. I was in one of my classes, and the lady said, "You know what? I have my emergency fund over at a bank locally that's like an hour from here." And she said, "I can't. I can access my funds through ATM, but it costs me a fee." And she said, "But I do it purposely that way because normally I don't need to tap into it. It's usually not an emergency." that I would, and she said, if it would be in my normal banking account where I could just move it from savings to checking, I'd spend it like crazy. So sometimes you just need that bank. So if you're looking for another bank, maybe to put out of sight, out of mind, the just partial direct deposit could earn some cash incentives, which then could boost maybe a savings option. If you're looking to do a savings account, maybe kickstart that emergency fund, we can give you some cash incentives and that details are inside there. We've got this offer as well as a couple other offers with cash incentives, so we can go over that if anybody's interested. The other thing in the back, there was a list of locations, so I wanted to make sure you've seen that we are in 22 locations, um, if you have any questions or need anything. Um, and then, I don't have this in the back, but if anybody would like it, or maybe I'll just send it to Jennifer. This, I know we didn't talk about credit today, but I always like to bring my FICO booklet with me, and it's just a, really a booklet that talks about what is your credit, what's your credit score compiled of, um, how do I dispute things? How do I check my credit? I highly recommend checking your credit once a year through annualcreditreport.com. That website's inside here. If anybody, I'll send you, it's just a PDF. It's literally from, if you type in FICO, F-I-C-O.com, um, you'll actually, you can, you, can you can go into this um, little attachment. So it's a really good thing if you're thinking about spring cleaning and I was talking about kind of doing the check of everything. Don't forget about your credit score because that also can help you. It, it, the better your credit score, the better you have some some leeway to do some other things when it comes to even savings your savings account. Maybe it's refinancing or maybe doing a home equity so you can consolidate your debt, get your payments down to a smaller, more manageable amount so that you can actually pay things off. So there's things that you can do um, if you have good credit. If your credit needs some help, that's a great booklet to kind of help you figure out how, what do I need to do, what steps do I need to take in order to clean up my credit and help it be healthy. The main goal that we um, have for these classes is that people uh, become more financially healthy. And I know that sounds kind of weird, like when putting finances with their health, but it's such a true statement. It's not just about what we eat and if we exercise. 
Um, we can eat and exercise as much as we want and be in physically, physically really healthy, but mentally really stressed out because we're making some bad decisions when it comes to our money, and that can affect our whole life. It can affect how we're working and what, how we do our work. It can affect our relationships with others. So I highly recommend, if there's any situation in your life right now, whether good, bad, or ugly, I think I said that earlier, just chatting with somebody, get our, get our advice, talk to us, ask us questions. No question is silly. We've heard it and it's not uncommon and we probably personally have went through it. Um, so ask us questions. I know Martha's card is on the table here. You can email her. Um, I know sometimes one of the things that I have learned in the past is that money is very personal, right? We don't just divulge how much money we have in our checkbook in a class like this, right? So money is very personal. Sometimes people don't even talk to their spouses or their friends about their finances. So I don't expect you to just, you know, come to this class and just divulge your whole life to me. But I definitely want the opportunity to help you and so does Martha. So if there's something we can maybe answer, some questions that we could help you with. Um, I had one uh, in my class that asked me like, I don't know if my dad, if I'm POD on my parents account, what would be the best way to do that? So we gave them some advice. It wasn't about us opening a checking account for them. It was about making sure that they knew to ask the right types of questions when they went into that particular financial institution and things like that. So giving resources to help you make those better decisions. So we'll be here for a little bit longer. We have a little break before the next class. Feel free to come up and chat with us. We'd love the opportunity to talk to you more. If anybody is interested in, in opening an account, we do actually have some information that we can give you to get the ball rolling because we wouldn't realize that you guys work when when the banks are open, so if it's hard to get to a bank, we can help you with that too. Thanks. Thank Thanks, everybody.